All right. So we have a question. Does CME on Metscape count on application? Yes. How important is this? It goes under other accomplishments and it's nice to show CME activity. It shows that you're keeping yourself relevant and those are, you know, it's a trigger word that they're very used to continue medical education. That's good. So men should mention that at the end of July, there is a double AFP conference. How can I join without being a member? Because they did not allow me to become a member. Well, you won't be able to join if they're not going to allow you to become a member. So I believe the transitional membership is limited. And the other thing you may want to do is just go online to see if you could become a member. You could just join them without giving them a phone call, see if that works. But I'm probably smart in that. Once your AAP membership is exhausted, then that's it. All right. So we have another question. What is apply smart list data? Great question. Apply smart list data is AAMC's attempt to lessen the number of programs that candidates are applying to. And so over the years, there's been a noticeable increase in the number of applications that are being sent even by U.S. medical seniors to programs because you know, the, the alternative not matching into residency is just, it's, it's just unfathomable going through all of these years of, of medical school and then still not matching, uh, you know, two, $300,000 of student loans and, and no residency to, to call your own. And so AAMC said, look, there is a point of diminishing return. And so if you apply to, let's say, and it goes by specialty, if you apply to 40 versus 60, maybe you don't, there's diminishing return. But from a student's perspective, from a residency candidate's perspective, I don't blame you for applying to more programs. I don't blame you at all because again, the alternative is, is unbearable. So that's what that was, uh, the apply smart. Not sure how many are really listening to it, but it's certainly out there and I wanted to bring your attention to it. But more importantly, this should not be used by international medical graduates. And there is a disclaimer there that says that there's just not enough data for us to be able to, to ascertain whether those numbers are applicable. I did speak with representatives from AAMC in a conference. This was pre-pandemic. It was when they first came out with Apply Smart and kind of dove into it a little bit more. And she actually told me that there is actually evidence they did not discuss it online, but there are evidences for international medical graduates in certain specialties that if they do apply to more programs, that the benefits outweigh the cons. And so, uh, but again, they did not mention that AAMC is for uh, U.S. medical seniors and graduates uh, only. Well, as far as the data that they have and they were releasing, so that's where the focus of AAMC is. All right, let's go to the next question. If I have research experience with a professor that was in 2017 for six months and he is willing to write me a letter of recommendation, would this letter of recommendation count or no? Well, anything that you submit is fair game. So if you are choosing to submit a letter of recommendation from research to a residency program for PGY1, where there's most likely going to be zero research, then that's most that's the mistake. So it doesn't matter how many months and which institution you were with, but majority of researchers are bench research and there's no patient contact. And if there is patient contact, it's so focused, so laser focused on one or two topics because that's what research is about. So it's very hard to get a research letter of recommendation applicable to U.S. medical residency. Some do, but, you know, again, it's, it's, it's tough to uh, make that uh, delineation. I'm going to go now to the to the, all the questions that you all had asked in your registration form, just to make sure that we don't miss something. We have a hand raised. Uh, yes. Hello, uh, this is Michael. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, welcome. Uh, just a quick question. While I was like going in the biography, uh, it showed that I could hide my birthday. Uh, is that necessary, or like do residencies frown upon people approaching forty? <laughs> Well, you know, this, it always is, a, you know, we're always worried about that, right? Is age going to be an, an issue? And I think if you hide it, then that also sends a negative uh, message too. So it's a double-edged sword if you decide to hide it. I wouldn't hide it. I, would, I, would, I don't think you have anything to worry about at all, Michael. All right. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. No problem. All right. So here we go. These are the... 
questions asked by some of our members that they're most concerned with. All right. So what are you most concerned about this ERS application? Experience section, certifications and publications. I think we did a really uh, thorough job in covering those. Presenting the best application possible. Gap years. Gap years are a concern and they should always be a concern. And some of the best ways to deal with gap years is what you've been doing recently. Some of the gap, we cannot figure out what to do, but a lot of the gap we can. And so please come to an office hour so we can discuss those gap years. And if you are here and you'd like to discuss that here in the presentation, I'll be more than happy to discuss it with you and see if we can figure something out. Content and expectation. I think that's fair. Um, as far as content, it's something that you should do over time. Give yourself a month to fill this application out. It takes a while to do it. Keep going back to it. Do not certify it until you know, you've printed it. You've had multiple eyes looking at it and it all looks good. And I've also cleared it under the 60 second first impression review of your entire application package. So that's as far as the content goes. And this webinar certainly does a lot of good and is, is very helpful to that end. As far as expectations, I mean, the expectation is to get an interview. And if you follow all of these directions and you have great clinical experiences and your letters of recommendation are solid and every other aspect of your application, you know, has the least number of red flags, then of course your expectation, you get closer and closer to your expectation, which is to secure interviews. One interview is not enough, two is not enough, three, four, five are not enough, even though you may match with just one interview, but the, the magical number is, is six, six interviews in the same specialty is where what you're looking for. So that should be your expectation. And the more red flags that there are and that has not been addressed, or if we just wing it, then, then the lower our expectation should be from our application. And the challenge is that, you know, if you do have red flags, you have to apply to hundreds of programs for it to even have any sort of statistical traction. And how do you go about spending five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 on ERAS when you know for a fact that you know, for example, you know, you haven't passed the OET or you haven't uh, taken one of the USMLEs or you don't, you only have one letter of recommendation and now you're going to go back to an, uh, to a foreign country and get three more letters from them and still go ahead and apply because you don't want to miss this match season. These are things that we should be discussing right now and not September 28th and 29th. So we got to deal with these. You've got to deal with them so that the, the more of this that you deal with now, the higher your expectation could be. CME counts for matching in family medicine like Medscape. CME does count. Uh, it's not unique to just family medicine, but CME is important. So make sure you do mention that. It, it makes you look like you're relevant and you've kept yourself relevant year over year. The next concern is multiple attempts in step two CK and low passing score. You know, it's, it's important to program directors, but it depends on the, the specialty. And I think moving forward to uh, step one, becoming pass failed and CK score could potentially be viewed by some programs uh, a little bit, you know, more analytically. But what is more important than the scores is the attempts. The only way to deal with attempts is to pass step three. That's your, you're the only group of individuals that I would say that you've got to consider step three or level three if you're an osteopath and that you don't have a choice if you've had multiple attempts and if you've gone through the match before and then you've just haven't gotten any interviews. So, but uh, I don't want you to just haphazardly go ahead and take it because it's a very high stakes exam. And if you fail step three, now you really are sealing the deal to not get any interviews at all. I mean, whatever chance remains. But one of the best ways to respond to multiple USMLE attempts is by showing them that the entire series of exams are done and they don't have to worry about you failing another USMLE. But that doesn't mean they're not worried about you failing the board exam or doing really poorly in the in-training exam, ITE. So, you know, we got to... That, but that's the, the the best way to deal with with multiple attempts. Now there are people that don't take step three, that don't take level three, and they still match. Uh, USMLE step three is pretty low on the uh, program director survey as far as it being a factor for program directors to offer interviews. Uh, but for those with multiple attempts, it is uh, it is more important. Letters of recommendation is another member's concern, and absolutely, it is a. Um, it is a major concern at all times. I'm always worried about letters of recommendation. I'm always worried about their content. 
I'm worried about them not being you know, uploaded on time. So go to our residency prep academy, acmedical.org forward slash residency hyphen prep and look for the card that says letters of recommendation. So look for that. And then there's a really a lot of really good resources for letters of recommendation. But you know, you need four letters of recommendation and they need to be uploaded and ready to go by September 28th. So if you're applying to family medicine, you need to have at least three from family medicine, one from a related specialty, maybe internal medicine, or maybe all four of them from family medicine. If you are applying to internal medicine, you want three from internal medicine, one maybe from cardiology or pulmonology, or all four from internal medicine. So you want the majority of your letters to be from the specialty you're applying to. The next concern is how to complete the ERS application if you're applying to multiple specialties. And my question to you would be, why would you be applying to multiple specialties? Applying to multiple specialties lowers your chances of securing interviews and a match. And uh, now every year we have, you know, a handful of members that apply to multiple specialties. And originally, you know, they thought that they had a greater chance in applying, getting interviews in internal medicine. And they also applied to family medicine. And they got a couple of interviews in family medicine. So you do have those edge cases as well, but I don't think that you should base your decision off of edge cases. If you're absolutely dead set on applying to multiple specialties, you don't cut the number of programs you're applying to by half and say, well, I'm gonna do 50% of the 200 programs I've budgeted for into internal medicine, another you know, 50% of that, you know, only 100 of them I wanna apply to the family medicine. That's a, that's a bad way to do it. If you're gonna apply to multiple specialties, you double your budget. So now you would have to apply to 200 and FM, 200 and IM. And that's the only way that you're going to potentially have any statistical traction. But that means you're, you have to prepare your application for both IM and FM. That means you have to have, you know, three months of IM clinical experience and at least three months of FM experience just so that you could have, you know, six, seven letters of recommendation so that you could mix and match them and apply to these program and be taken seriously. So it's a valid concern. Letters of recommendation are valid concern and how you put them together is really important. Personal statement is a concern. Please watch our YouTube webinar that we posted, the do's and don'ts of personal statement. Posted that for this year's match and it's, uh, it's going to be relevant for quite some time. So take a look at that. I think you're going to enjoy that. As far as your CV, you don't have to worry about creating a CV. ERAS creates a CV of your application automatically. You just have to worry about making sure that the ERAS application is consistent, professional, and it is uh, very accurate. And that's what we're here to do with you. And so take advantage of the analysis and editing sessions uh, if it's included in your membership. Another member is worried about the process. Deadlines is what you have to be concerned about. So from now, Get your token. If you haven't done so already, start filling out the application. And about 30 days before September 29th is uh, the latest you want to go ahead and submit your ERS application to us for us to uh, analyze and edit. But again, the longer you wait, the, the higher the chances of us not being able to get that to you without you doing an expedited service paying an expedited service fee and we don't want you to do that. So plan ahead, start putting the application together now so that when you do receive the notification on, on how to submit your application and your personal statement for analysis and edit, then you know how to do it and it's all ready. How to overcome red flags in my application? There is, uh, you know, depends on the red flags and certainly office hours is a good time to go through them. Make sure that you register for an office hour and we'll discuss them. Details of research and my work experience. What a great question. So a lot of times uh, people double dip, right? They, they, their research was, uh, was a paid position. So they take it and they put it on their work. And then they also put that same research under research. And research, if it's paid or unpaid, goes under research. It doesn't go under work and research at the same time. Another member's concern is pathway six. Valid concern. And I don't think that ECFMG up to this day has given us any uh, new indications of what how this path, pathway six is going to be carried out. Uh, there is some information on ECFMG's website, but you know I believe the application is still pending. And and how do you pick the attending physician? And you know it's got to be uh, you know there's a lot of details that uh, that will be released uh, soon. So keep checking ECFMG's pathway six page uh, for new updates. Uh, and uh, and then register for an office hour, and then we'll cover it. Another member's concern is I've never filled an ERAS application before. And what a valid concern. It's a daunting piece of document uh, to fill out and you have to be mindful of so many different things. So hopefully this presentation was helpful to you and, and us being there for you uh, hopefully is, is sufficient. 
about your graduation year. Yes, that could be a problem if uh, if you haven't done any U.S. clinical experiences. And but just keep in mind, in the Journal of Academic Medicine, there was a publication that says, "Hey, what you know? What are the three international medical graduate internship performance indicators?" and and um, one of them was the performance on standardized examinations. And so that was one. The second performance indicator was the type of clinical activity in the 24 months before residency starts, which is these clinical experiences. So if, you've, if your medical school graduation was 10, 15 years ago, but if you've done some really, really quality clinical experiences in the couple of years before residency starts, then maybe that kind of counteracts it a little bit. Uh, to your favor, uh, somewhat to your favor. But again, if it's been years since you graduated from medical school, you, you can't do anything other than than beef up your application and front load it with new clinical experiences and, and new letters of recommendation. MSPE is another member's concern. If you go to acmedical.org forward slash MSPE, we have a lot of really, really good topics there. We do have an MSPE drafting service as well. If your school dean is open to getting assistance in how to complete the MSPE based on the new 2016 recommended guidelines by AAMC. So if they are, then you want to certainly contact us and let us know. But we do have an MSPE drafting service as well. But both acmedical.org forward slash MSPE, go there and check everything out. And, and on that page, there's a link to drafting as well. Another member's concern was uh, if they're in a test prep course for 18 months for USMLE step one, two CK and CS originally, and that they're concerned about that 18 months because potentially that could be a gap, it could not, but it, you know, and a lot of people do this because of visa sponsorship. You know, some of the, uh, the test prep companies, they, they sponsor visas and, and so you could go there and they, you know, they stay there, you stay there for, for a year and a half. US MLEs, if you take more than six months to study for them, then that is, that doesn't look good uh, because the US medical seniors didn't have that much time to study for it either. So if they didn't, and you had one year, two years, three years to study for the US MLEs, then of course, you know, your score is probably going to be, uh, probably going to be a little bit higher. That could work against you. So how do we mention this? Uh, I think that you just go ahead and put the test prep course that you took for 18 months under education. If that test prep company was accredited by a, you know, by an accreditation agency that accredits colleges, and you can then put that under education. Even if they were not accredited, you can still put that under education, but I certainly don't think you should put that uh, under work experience or, uh, or any other section under experience. This concludes our webinar. All right, we have a couple of questions here. How can I join AAFP with seven-year graduation gap? Go online and click the transitional membership and see if you can join them. And uh, if not, then, then they're pretty specific and they will not allow older graduation dates to, to join. And that's per the request of family medicine program directors. There were a lot of medical graduates going to the national conference for years and they've been out of medical school for 10, 15, 20 years. And, and when they went to this national conference, the program directors thought that they were overwhelming the meeting times and uh, they made a request to AAFP to limit who actually comes to these meetings. And that's, the, 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 that's where this whole thing stemmed from, unfortunately. So that's, that's a challenge. All right, uh, Michael, you have your hand raised. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. I, yeah, I just noticed while filling out uh, my diploma, it says uh, I got my diploma July 1st and then uh, but for my MSPE, it said I grant like uh, my my degree was up to uh, June, basically. So is that a mismatch in, in a state? It is, isn't it? That is. OK, so I have to contact my school and try to get that fixed. Yes. Have them say it's that it, my school is from this date to July, not June. And, okay. and it's got to be a specific date. So I, I always recommend that you do, you know, the exact date where you graduated from medical school should be your last day of medical school. So whatever is the exact date on the diploma is what you should use from your MSP. Okay. okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Great question. All right. Let's see. Next question is, what about ADHD? I think you would know your ADHD quite well and, and how uh, debilitating it is, if, if at all. And so if it's to the point where it's debilitating you, then you want to probably come to my office hour and we got to talk about it. I don't easily want to just go ahead and say, 
no to that question of whether I could carry out the duties of a resident. It's a pretty big deal. There was a uh, there was a resident that was dismissed from an OBGYN residency. She was a U.S. grad, and she did not disclose that she had tremors. She had essential tremors. And so in the operating room, they started noticing that, and the program director got pretty upset that she didn't disclose that. You know, but she figured out a way to deal with it and she stabilized her hands and all that, but I guess it wasn't good enough for the program director. So I think every case is, is quite unique. And, and I think that the thing with ADHD and, and adults, especially with USMLEs, I think that a lot of people try to abuse that. And I don't want you to look like you're trying to uh, try to get special favoritism uh, if it's something that you can deal with without bringing it right up. So I probably would say, no, don't need to mention it unless you truly think that it's a debilitating condition or it's going to affect you being a resident. Let's go to the next question regarding licensure. Does residency training licensure count? Which was issued from the state medical board. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Those would be a temporary uh, or training license and it does count. Next question. Will it be wise to apply for residency with two letters of recommendation? No, absolutely not. Next question, is there an age range that I shouldn't release my birthday? I think we, uh, I don't know what that range would be. I can tell you that if a program likes your application, they're not going to be concerned about your age. So I think age, the way that that spells out in your application is that, you know, whether your application looks dated, but if you have a lot of recent activities, um, you know, and you, you're, you know, you're in your forties or fifties or sixties and you have a lot of recent clinical activities and you have great letters of recommendation, you still want to put it out there and, uh, and just so that they know that you're transparent and, and you're being upfront with everything. For AAFP, the transitional membership is one year. Any other way to show dedication to family medicine, any other societies? National Rural Health Association. And then the Society for Teachers of Family Medicine, STFM. Those are two. I don't think with STFM, there's a, there's a graduation requirement at all. Should we use a letter of recommendation from research while applying to internal medicine? The content of letters is what matters. And so I cannot give you a blanket yes, just simply because it's a research letter or give you a blanket no. So I would like to see the letter of recommendation. We have a letter of recommendation analysis session. Once I look at it, then I can tell you how relevant that letter is, whether it's from research or from clinicals or observership or from abroad, whatever it is, um, we got to look at the letter and its content. So upload that. And that's the other reason why I don't recommend that you waive your right to see them because otherwise we don't know how to guide you. Well, everyone, thank you so much for coming and sharing your Sunday afternoon with me. I really appreciate it. Hopefully this was helpful and you putting your US application together post pandemic. And we're almost there. We've almost made it to the, uh, the end of the pandemic. And for those of you in other countries, whether you're still going through it, heart goes out to you. And, and you know the, the silver lining is that you don't have to travel to the US for your interviews and you can do them over there. But everybody, please be safe and uh, remain healthy and uh, know that we're here and supporting you and, and take advantage of your membership benefits. If you do not have a match certified or a residency entry membership, please upgrade your clinicals only or express membership. So at least we could assist you and we could mentor you and, and help you revise your documents. Again, thank you so much for your time that uh, you spent with me. It means a lot. We'll see you in our next webinar, step one, pass, fail, and step two, CS cancellation. It's on August 5th. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.